Hi, this is Courtney Britton with the Texas Wildlife Association. Thank you for joining us for today's Wildlife for Lunch. The topic is Ranch Nature Photography for Fun and Profit, and it's presented by John F. Martin, the Martin Refuge and Chairman of the Images for Conservation Fund. The Wildlife for Lunch series is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the AgriLife Extension. John, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Uh, let me go ahead and make it so that your mic works. Appreciate it. Uh, are okay. you there? Am yep, I on? we're here. I? You're on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see time remaining as two minutes before it's supposed to start, but uh, at least that's what's on my screen. Uh, I've been involved in, in as a landowner and in conservation for uh, 25 to 30 years, and I've been concerned that that everything is looked at through the, if you want conservation, it only happens at the state and federal level, and everybody forgets that, that something like 70% of the land east of the Mississippi, I mean, east of the Rocky Mountains is uh, privately owned, and without the participation of the private landowner, there literally can be no, uh, no conservation in, a, in saving ecosystems. So let's see, Courtney, am I getting this thing to, uh, to try to... Uh, uh, I think you need um, to click the little arrow for the first time, John, and, and then it should advance using the space bar. Uh, which arrow am I looking at? At the top of the screen, right above where it says Ranch Nature, there should be a um, uh, a little, there you go, that one. You got it. Okay. Hmm. I clicked it once, it didn't, I'm not moving anything. It's moving on our end, uh, just one second. It's not, it's not moving on my screen. <laughs> That's all. Okay, well, it's moving. It's moving on our side. I'm still seeing ranch photography, nature photography for fun and profit. And I don't okay, can you go that. up to the? Can you click on John? Can you click on view at the top in the blue bar, and then synchronize my display? I'm looking at uh, a full screen. Right down at the bottom there, it should say synchronize my display. Synchronize for all? Yes, click that. OK. I have clicked it. I don't know what that does. Did it bring you to the current slide? Nope. And you're still connected to the internet, correct, John? You haven't lost internet connection. I, I have not lost internet connection. Okay, it's advancing for us. We're now on slide four. What is the future for Texas ranches when you're okay. when you're pushing the button? So, is it advancing okay. on your screen as well? Nope. <laughs> okay. So, well, you're... how about this? Go ahead. Uh, essentially, if I, being a Texan and being and my land is in Texas, I've and being here, I've focused primarily on Texas. But everything we talk about fits in every private land holding from northern Canada to the tip of South America, uh, which is roughly 90% privately owned. Uh, and that's why it's so important if we're talking migratory birds or we're talking anything in form of wildlife conservation, if we cannot develop a program dealing with private lands, uh, there's not going to be any conservation. And uh, you know, to me, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, I should, you know, so there's some questions there that you need to ask yourself if you're a landowner, if you're a rancher, uh, you know, what is, what is the future of my ranch? What do I want it to be? Uh, if you drive out to California and you see these wonderful historic ranches with big signs and they are the, the 
subdivision, the development is named for the ranch. And, and every square inch of the ranch is taken into housing. And, and you know, you, if you said, if I drove by, if I drove by that and I saw that, that'd make me the happiest guy in the whole world, then, then that's one way. If you look at your land, as I looked at men, and the reason I bought it was to have the, the ecosystem of South Texas and to be a part of it, and that I love wildlife and I love the outdoors, but I've always wanted to look for a profitable way to own it because I come from a profit industry, the investment brokerage industry. Uh, and so I look at my land and I say, I want it to look this way for into perpetuity, but I also want it to pay for itself and generate a profit and, and because I'm a businessman. Uh, so I want the land to stay where it is and how it is but I want to have something from the wildlife that actually creates value and it creates wealth and it creates conservation uh, all in one package. And so that's, that's been my mission. Uh, I'm sorry for the bangs. My computer does that for some reason, uh, if you're hearing that. So I'm the, the, I have several questions that I did it advance, Courtney. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. My mine is not advanced okay. for some reason. Okay. Let me take. So. Let me go ahead and take the control back, and um, you can just maybe we'll see if you can if it looks differently when, while I'm doing it, and then you can just say next. Let's do that. Okay. Let me. Okay, John, are you now? Uh, does the slide say what is the future? for Texas ranches on your screen? Uh, no, I not yet. You, you haven't taken control from on my screen. Hmm. OK, well, I have. And it's working for everyone except for you, which I apologize. I've never had this issue. I'm not sure what's going on while it's, your it's screen is technology. not advancing. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it just so happens that, my, uh, that David's logged in and I can uh, so I guess the question is where is Texas going where we're, our population is growing at faster than any other state in the nation and pretty soon we're going to look like California or we're going to look like New York and so what is the future of Texas ranches and and I have a concern that we are fragmenting our historic ranches at a historically rapid rate, and there won't be anything left in the future. Uh, a lot of people may disagree with me on that, but our growth rate, I can see the day when there will be 100 million people living in Texas, and what land will be left in conservation. So I think the, uh, the key here is, uh, how about your ranch? What do you want it to look like? And what do you want your kids to see in the future? And how do you want your kids involved? And can, Courtney, can you yes. advance it for me? Yes, I okay. can. OK, so advance. So we just left so, the slide that said, what is the future of your ranch? And now we have a, a, a picture slide. A picture slide. Of a, yes. of a bird on yes. a cactus? Or it's on a it piece of wood eating a worm. Uh, that would be a green jay. Yes, that's what and, it is. And, OK. Uh, these images are throughout this, and it's to show you all of these were taken by amateur photographers at professional settings uh, that will show you that these are not accidental. These are on ranches that were set up for great imagery, for photographers of all levels to be able to take great photo photographic images. And so you're going to you're going to be able to see that. So let's go to the next slide. OK. John, do you maybe want to just pull the pre minimize the screen right now with the 
a WebEx event, just minimize it and, and pull up your presentation in a separate win separate screen, and that way you can see what you're looking at, and you can just say advance, and I'll, pr I'll well, forward it on here in the seminar. David, could you, if, if you just hit the button, I, I'm on my other screen here, I can see what's happening. Okay. Is is da so on David's screen you can see what's happening? Yeah. Okay. Would you like for me to make David um, able to forward the slides since you're with him? Oh, that'd be probably wonderful. Okay. Hang on one second, David. Let me get you. So you're gonna make it so you can forward the slides by hitting the, uh, the that button. Okay, David, you're now in charge of the slides. Folks, I apologize for this. We, you wouldn't know it, but we did practice, and it worked just fine. <laughs> it worked great. Okay. Uh, so the next question, and I run into this in families who have owned land for considerable period of time. Uh, what do you, a lot of kids love the ranch, but their parents are saying, you know, we have a 3,000-acre ranch, or we have a 10,000-acre ranch, but with cattle and hunting, you can you can only support one family on the ranch, and so you need to go be a doctor or a lawyer or a, a businessman or investment broker somewhere where you have a profession that you can make considerable income. Uh, and so the kids leave the land, they lose their touch with the dirt, and they marry someone who's not part of the land. And then to them in the future, it's just a piece of dirt worth money. And they've lost that touch with the, with the land itself. And, and so the question I have for parents is, would you like for your kids to have an income equal to what they could make as a doctor or a professional in some level and never leave the land? So that, let's go to the next slide. Did it change? Did you no, it did not change from my view. Okay, so that's we're still back to mine. Okay, um, just John, why don't you just say next, and I'll advance the slides. Okay, we'll we'll keep working on that. Okay, thank you. Next. Do you want to go to the next slide? Uh. uh David's did not. It, we're having the same problem. Oh, okay, now it did. What you're seeing there is a photo blind. It's one of the original photo blinds that we built. This photography industry has been going for a number of years, and you're going to see several blinds throughout the presentation. And this is, this is what is called a photography setting on a ranch that is set up for photography. The design of the blinds has changed dramatically over the last 10 years because the original only photo blind we had as a model was called the Rue blind. It was a portable blind. It was made totally out of canvas. It was five feet across and five feet high, and you had to climb in on your hands and knees. So our original model, which was the only blind there was, uh, was not a good model. So now the blinds I'm building today are six feet wide and 12 feet long. So let's go to the next slide. Try the middle button. Anyway, uh, there we are. Uh, so the question is, as always, when you're, when you're going out and you want to buy a ranch, can you buy a ranch and pay for it from the income from the ranch? And 100% of the people today will say, unless there's oil and gas under it and you get the minerals, there is no way you're ever going to pay for a ranch from the income from a ranch. And my search uh, for the last 20 years has been to figure out how to have a industry and a, a that would allow you to buy a ranch and pay for it. So let's go to the next slide.
Okay. It has not, yeah. Again, this is another image of taken from a photo blind that uh, is of a, a cactus wren, but we'll, let's keep going since I can't do this. Next slide, please. John, I think yours is just slightly delayed. Your connection may be a little bit slower than, than ours, so uh, okay. it's taking it a minute to, to advance on your side. Okay, I see the I see the situation. The second thing I've watched over the last ten or fifteen years is we end up fighting nature, whether it's a predator control program or whether we're bulldozing the brush to create more grass, which then works well as long as there's lots of rain. But when when a drought comes along, there's neither prickly pear nor nor mesquite beans or anything for the either the cattle or the wildlife to uh, to live on, and so all we have is a dry piece of land with no grass. Uh, incorporating a photography operation within your your uh, ranch, one of the things that will do is wildlife comes to water. So if you have created settings with water, with photo blinds, and you've created a lot of these so to offer a lot of different uh, experiences, suddenly all of the wildlife benefits from having that water and that feed that you're using to attract the wildlife. With that in mind, then in the middle of the worst drought, when you're selling your cows to get so that you, because you have no grass, that is a premium time for people to photograph the biodiversity on your ranch. So in essence, you have stopped fighting nature, and you're literally helping and working with nature. Uh, and uh, one of the things I've learned recently is uh, one of our landowners is a is has a deer hunting ranch but they also have photography. And he said the key to, they, they, this last year in the middle of the worst drought in South Texas, they had a 85% recruitment rate of their, of their fawns. And he said it wasn't because we, we did anything with the predators, it wasn't because the key was that they had water everywhere and the fawns and the deer did not have to move long distances to get a drink. And when the temperatures are soaring to 105 degrees, if they have to go a long way, he's, he's saying that he thinks that's the key to their success uh, is having lots of water. Well, that water is in the form of photo settings. So, and they're nearby and they're close, and so the water, again, as part of the photography, is good for everything, including your big deer, and you get a much better recruitment. Uh, next slide. So, the, uh, again, the images you're seeing, uh, let's leave them up for just about four or five seconds. They're all designed, again, you'll see wonderful images. These were all taken by amateurs. Uh, and, and again, some of you may not like snakes, but if that snake, we, we have in our settings, inevitably when photographers are sitting there, a rattlesnake will come in and it will uh, it'll set up shop to wait for something to come in. The photographers go crazy trying to be there to photograph the snake just as he is, but if he gets really lucky and a, a mouse or a rabbit or a bird comes in and they can actually get that on, that's a once in a lifetime shot. They will pay big dollars for that opportunity. That's part of the experience that you're marketing. Uh, at Martin Refuge, we have never killed a rattlesnake and they have become significant money makers for us. Next slide. And you'll see in these slides that we have tried a, a lot of different types of photo blinds. You'll see PVC blinds, we've tried metal frames, we've tried wood frame, movable blinds uh, in the ground at eye level photo blinds. We, you know, these have all, we've worked 
it, it's not a science. It's a it's a moving target as to what is creates the best opportunity with the right light for brake photography. The key that we're seeing is that in the United States we love rec pastimes. That recreation is the key to everything. Whether it's uh, I just recently returned from a fishing trip to New Mexico. I was talking to this rancher. It's a Vermejo Park Ranch in, in New Mexico. It's the largest single contiguous ranch in America. And we're talking with them about uh, putting photography in at the same level as their fishing and their hunting and the creating photography areas that will attract additional people. We're also talking about a single ranch pro tour event on this ranch. But the, the key is that there is a professional competition in almost every single recreational activity. Next slide. And mine again is on a somewhat uh, delayed. Uh, so if you see, you know, again, you'll see roadrunners and and we have some questions, and I think Courtney is accumulating the questions to be answered at the very end. So I want to we're going to move through this. I'm glad you're typing your questions so that we'll be able to uh, see them. But here again, just to go through this, if you look at the the types of recreational activities and yet the quality of the professional uh, uh, opportunities that also create then the business model for the amateurs. And whether it's the game of golf, and I'm, I am truly the world's worst golfer, that's why I had to pick up photography because I, I can't play the game of golf. I love basketball, I love football, I love all these things and I've played them all, but I am the world's worst golfer. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a good business model for the for to copy and to look at. Next slide. So the again, uh, recreation. These are all have created jobs. They created wealth and they created opportunities. Uh, there's a photo setting that again at Martin Refuge uh, that you'll have a chance to look at. Uh, it's mainly you'll see it, that the whole concept is to be to have a breathable blind. Uh, we we've seen some made completely of plywood. Uh, we occurred a ranch uh, a few a couple of months ago where the where every blind that was going to be used was made of solid plywood, and I said, well. Do you want, uh, if you put no water in the blind, you'll have broiled photographer. If you have a little water in there, you can have boiled photographer. Or if you do it just right, you could market a sauna. These have to breathe because photography is done during the warmer months, not during the colder months. It can be in the colder months, but primarily uh, our, our time is after hunting season through all the way through the fall. So you, you could, but it could be a year-round activity if you do not have hunting or it can integrate with your hunting process. Digital photography has created a totally new industry. And I say this, we've been photographing uh, since uh, 1872 in nature as, and maybe even before that. But photography has always been used as a recording device of history, uh, an artistic endeavor, uh, but it's never been looked on like fishing or like hunting is, as an activity all into its own that is an experiential activity. Uh, we now have a, a opportunity where you take the photograph and instantly you can see what the image is and whether you took a good one or whether you need to make some adjustments. And the amateurs can now use these for easy use. Most important today is the ability to share that image within seconds of the rest of the world. And, and so Let's go on to the next slide, but, but 
I, that's why we now have a new recreational industry industry where people can actually have a wildlife experience exactly the same as they experience with hunting and fishing. And that's just being out there enjoying nature and taking great images. Uh, if you, but how do we get that industry going? By the way, the bird you're seeing there is maybe two inches long, but it's in a wonderful setting at a photo blend. And, and so that's why it's so important. And so we have a new recreation, a new industry that can be developed. Uh, let's keep going. So we can, that bird that you saw was on a perch that was hand selected and put in place where it would go to that perch before it went down to either food or water. It's, it's not a science, but it is, uh, we're learning as we go along, how do you create great images? And that is like working with an interior decorator. How do I make my house pleasant and inviting and, and for people to want to go sit in an area and have a conversation center? Well, the same thing, how do I create a opportunity for inviting the wildlife to come to the right spot for the right image and the right experience of the photographer. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So what if, you know, again, what is the benefit to this? Well, all economics seem driven, with the exception of hunting and fishing, are driven to metropolitan urban centers. Well, I see nature photography as being the rural economic development tool of Texas and America. And what will it accomplish? It will create jobs, but I, I, not just jobs. I see this as a career creation event, an opportunity where people can actually make a six-figure income from being involved in this industry. Destination marketing, some of the biggest careers in the nation are made in destination marketing. Nature tourism we know goes on probably as far as I'm concerned and images for conservation fund. Wildlife conservation is the, this is the tool for it. You show me a fellow with a 500 acre ranch that is making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year from wildlife photography and I'll show you a guy that will never clear it because he's making a significant income. The wildlife has earned its way to be kept. This is a T90 little bird that again is in a perfect setting that has been set up for a great image. Next image. The, the key to all of this is, again, I come from an economic industry, being an investment broker for 30 years. And if we don't create economic development, jobs and wealth, we will not get conservation. So today we have uh, nature photography is a $2 billion industry, but 11 million people travel eight days or more annually away from home. They have incomes of $50,000 or more. Why is that not a bigger industry? Uh, it's because the private sector, almost all of these people go to public land where they're charged two or three or five dollars to go to it. We have to get them to see that one, the experience of photography on private land, the images that you have seen to this point, that, that image can never be taken on public land or if it is, it will be an extreme lucky shot. We can create that shot every day on, on our place. Why? Because we're set up for that. Public lands are not and won't ever be set up for great photography. And that's where the private landowner can benefit the absolute most 
by offering and opening their ranch and then setting it up for, for photography. As compared with golf, though, golf is the private sector. And as you can see there, it is $60 billion larger than, than nature photography. Nature photography has 30 million participants of that 11 travel. Golf has 26 million, but is significantly larger because it is involved in the private sector. What I look at, though, is how many acres of land have been protected for golfers' habitat, which also offers some wildlife habitat, but it's secondary. Golfers want a great place. In McAllen, Texas, the golf course, McAllen Country Club, is right across from the from the sun from the mall, right a mile a half a mile away from the airport, but it will never be developed. It will always be green space because it has economic value to be there. Again, you're looking. This is one of our oldest plans, could four feet wide and eight feet long, and I thought that was great compared to a, a rude blind. Now we've learned people want more room. They'd like to have more space to move around. And, and that doesn't affect the wildlife. So here's the ownership of land, of habitat, throughout the United States and the Western Hemisphere. So if you can tell me how much absolute conservation can we have if we ignore the private landowner? And the answer is there will never be any conservation unless there's economics. Next slide. I can talk about this all day long because it is of supreme importance. I've been involved in all kinds of, of the public side of conservation. And, and I believed at the time I was doing the right thing. This is a very bunting. It is one of the most beautiful birds in the world. You see it's a full frame shot. That, sh that whole setting was set up to be able to get that shot of any bird of that size at the water hole with the right image and full frame. Uh, birds about maybe two and a half inches long. So you can, this shows sort of the use of topography. We didn't have to put that blind in the ground. There was a, a, a bench that was maybe three feet higher. So we cut into the bench, put the blind in place, and the water hole then is up on that bench at eye level. So what we need is a catalyst to make this industry grow. Uh, just like in golf, seven, eight golfers in 1917 started the Pro Tour of Golf, and little did they realize that they were going to create a $62 billion industry, and they did. Uh, they did it with the Pro Tour of Golf, and so ICF has taken, tried to copy this model and say, let's create the Pro Tour of Photography, and then let's create the weekend tournaments for the amateurs, and that will help market and drive the industry and get the public actually experiencing private land photography. Next slide. Uh, the key here is, is how do we get make that happen? Images for Conservation Fund has held three professional tournaments, one in the Hill Country, one in the Coastal Bend, and one in the borderlands of Laredo, Texas. We have paid out $500,000 in prize money in those three tournaments. 50%, $250,000 of that went to the ranches where we, that actually hosted the photographers. Uh, so we've created the Pro Tour uh, to, to get the, and, and for several reasons, in the next slide you'll, uh, I'll go into that, but uh, the Pro-Am tournaments that we're developing this year are designed to include the, the amateur photographer. And we've had people, we've held three of these this year, two Pro-Ams and one Pro-Am youth. 
Uh, and we've had photographers from as far away as Virginia and New Mexico coming and participating in these. Uh, that uh, little water hole where that cardinal is taking a bath designed again to attract the birds in, get them bathing, and get great images. Uh, next slide. So, so we will, you know, again, this is a nationwide, this is a worldwide industry that is there. People from Europe travel. They go to Africa. The Asians travel, and they photograph wildlife. So the Pro Tour of Nature photography is designed to be the richest in the world. Uh, we try to go to a new region. We're now talking with landowners uh, both in New Mexico and Wyoming for creating a one ranch tournament uh, instead of using 20 different ranches. Uh, in the past three, we've done gone to a region, recruited 20 ranches, brought in 20 professional photographers in a one month tournament. Uh, we, we were exploring a one ranch tournament that has great biodiversity on it by itself. Uh, so it, it, this is a model that can work on any size, whether they're 100 acre ranches like they, you'd encounter in the east or large ranches you'd encounter in the west. But the key is to, to use that uh, to educate the public, educate the local business community, and educate the ranches about the benefits of nature photography and wildlife photography. Everything on those ranches, as you see, invertebrates are there. Insects are important. They make great images. Macro photography is one of the things that is really uh, that and flowers and plants. So you have, on your ranch, you can offer it lots of things. So again, we, we want to get the media involved. Uh, I, I've, I think now Texas Wildlife Association at this convention is offering their first ever photography uh, opportunity for landowners that, uh, that I'm, I'm really happy with because I welcome TWA as a partner in photography and wildlife. Uh, next slide. The, the, again, when we talk about this industry and it's important that we talk about destination marketing. One ranch in an area does not make a destination. Five ranches in, a, in an area is a opportunity for some economic development. I envision the regions of Texas attracting 40 or 50,000 photographers a year, which would require then uh, 20 to 50 ranches be set up in photography eventually in each region. Uh, so that that the, there's there's in order to accomplish that, there has to be land with habitat and wildlife. We have to have landowners that want to share their their whole nature experience with photographers. Destination marketing, and we need traveling photographers. Here's the key. We need them to know and understand the real benefits of being on private land. And that's the marketing. That's the, the destination marketing. And, and that's important. We're, we're, we have to make that happen. Uh, this cardinal is just, you know, again, this is, this is a phenomenal setup. Actually can't tell, but that was designed to bring that cardinal to that spot for a great image. Next slide. So now for the first time in history, we have conservation of wildlife tied directly to value. Everything on, the, my experience, my whole life tells me that if I want to save, if I want to save mountain lion, I have to make those mountain lion more valuable than what they eat. If I want to save horned lizards, they have to be worth saving. They has to be at each one of those has to carry an economic value in order for people 
to to keep them on their lands. Uh, this is a little black uh, capped uh, titmouse, and it's found only here in South Texas. The titmice that you have in the hill country and other parts are just uh, they're they're different. So, private lands nature photography industry offers. To me, it is the only sustainable uh, conservation that we can, that there is. Everything else is simply temporary. We've seen it with hunting. Hunting offers sustainable income and has kept millions of acres in wildlife habitat, but it values only a few subjects. In other words, deer, turkey, quail, and, and it works. It absolutely works. And so using that as a model again, I, I really think that we, we've got to uh, expand that and create greater economics. So now we're in ICF primarily because of economics. Uh, we got hit by the, in, in 09 with the economic downturn, uh, became much harder to find sponsorships. And so we, we stepped back and said, well, what's the next level we need to develop in this industry? We have ranches that are set up. We now need to try to help those develop. So we've created a whole new thing that has never occurred. You know, we're always breaking ground somewhere, I guess. Uh, and so we're, we're, we've designed a pro-am tournament where we have a workshop where people can learn great photography, learn how to make better images from a coach, not just a professional photographer teaching a workshop, but a coach who coaches you for four days or three days in a tournament where there's not a lot of money. It's, it's, it's simply like uh, playing golf for a, a 50 cents a hole or you're having your fishing with your buddies and you say, you know, let's all chip in $25 and, and we'll, uh, we'll do the next, you know, whoever gets the biggest fish or the most fish. So these images that you're looking at now are actually from the pro-ams that we held. One was held March 28th to April 1st and the other was held May 17th to May 21st. Uh, and we had people come from all over the state of Texas. What really was fun is we had landowners that are setting their ranches up for photography who said, I need to see how these things really work. And so they signed up. They paid the, the registration fee, the entry fee. They came down and they actually participated as if they were photographers because they're set, they, these were all amateurs. One fellow, uh, Mark Kostler, with Vermeo Park Ranch had, had hardly ever picked up a camera. But he won $5 the first day. You know, he, he, you know, it's not a lot of money in this, but he won third place in the first day's images. And the whole idea is to, to get, your, get your juices going to, to have fun at the same time that you're learning great photography. So next image. We're, you're going to see a few images from the, from the pro-ams. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not moving for some reason here. Uh, they're all taken by you know, a fellow named Chris uh, Collis. And, and the manager of the Santa Margarita Ranch is uh, are the our landowners that participated in the uh, May 17th event. And so the next thing that we we just held in the last two weeks was we've created the first ever Pro Am Youth Tournament, and we decided that we really wanted to work to start this with a group of young young people. So we started working with the Lynn San Manuel 4-H Club. So we're building a model competition that we really like working with 4-H clubs 
But once this model is complete, we can work with Texas Wildlife Association, we can work with Boy Scouts, uh, we can work with uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, all out on ranches where we can get these kids involved in nature photography. We selected the 4-H club because these are the kids that if we can really get involved in photography are going to be making the decisions on what happens on Texas ranches forever into the future. And so it's a great group to, uh, to get to understand photography. So you'll, you just, uh, as you see these images uh, pop up, these were all made by amateurs at settings that were professionally planned for them. The, here are the youth uh, for the event, and, and you'll see that these were all young ladies. So what we have next, and you can just peruse through these, uh, are images that we know that people throughout the country that are wildlife and nature photographers are willing to pay for. And these are folks who have all been to Martin Refuge. And I, I would like to say that I've, I've wanted a ranch to become the model ranch. Uh, the Santa Clara Ranch here in South Texas has put a tremendous effort into making this work on a 300-acre ranch. And now they're in there like their fifth or sixth year, and they are targeted to have an income, a gross income, that's not net, of $50,000 this year from photographers. Now, that amounts to about $170 an acre. I'm not aware of any uh, uh, activity on ranches except for maybe some good oil and gas wells that create $170 a year economic value. Uh, but these are all images that, are, that people are willing to pay for because they offer a great experience. Uh, and, and so as you, these are the, this is the last of the, uh, of the images. There will be a few here. You can just go peruse through those. But uh, Courtney, if you're ready to start uh, taking questions. Uh. OK, sure. Um, looks like we have one question asking about the, uh, the setup there for the blinds. Um, someone would like to know, what is the round pool in front of the blind constructed of, and how deep is it? Well, that's a great question, because we've, we've had to learn from this. We have tried liners like people use in their backyard fountains, and we have used uh, drilling mud uh, to hold the water as a, trying to keep life simple. Uh, where we have javelina down here, the javelina love to either put their feet through the landing or in the drilling mud case, eventually they just keep wallowing in it until they like the, the water all the way over under the brush. So they, within a couple of weeks, you'll have a nice pool under the brush where you can't photograph. So we've all arrived at creating uh, our photo pools out of concrete. Mine are the ancient type in that I have to deliver water to them via a 500-gallon tank and a person once or twice a week, depending on the weather, actually delivering it in this tank on a trailer. Uh, uh, Dos Fanadas Ranch, Santa Clara Ranch all use uh, plumbing, and they keep the water level with, with a uh, float valve. Uh, and so theirs are, are, they had to lay water line all the way out to their blinds, which then makes sense to keep your photography, if you're going to do that, in a fairly small area of a couple of hundred acres. And, and start small, even if you've got a 5,000-acre ranch. I say designate a 300-acre uh, area for, for that uh, and, and go with that. Courtney? Next question. OK. Um, we have a question that says, can you explain a little bit more about destination marketing? What exactly is that? Well, I guess that, that to keep life simple, it's a, it's a, 
the Rio Grande Valley is the premier destination for bird watchers in America. We get 150,000 bird watchers coming to this region uh, every year, leaving upwards to about $150 million in the economy. So we are a destination, and, and so you want, that's what you want to create. You want a region that attracts a large group of like-minded people to come to an area. The Hill Country of Texas is a de destination for people who want to, who enjoy wine. Uh, Sonoma, California is a destination for wine, for people who do wine tours. Uh, so that's the, the, the Gulf Coast is a destination for saltwater fishermen. And the Laguna Madre is one of the premier ones. I hope that makes sense. Next question. Okay. Uh, we have a question about um, how does an interested rancher get started on something like this? Well, I, my, I, I would advise, one, that if you have, if you're even an amateur photographer, that you literally sign up for one of our pro-ams and you come down and you sit in, a, in these blinds, you photograph from them, you get a coach who helps you understand how they work, and, and when you leave after that four days, you will know exactly what you need to do. Okay. Um, let's see. Our next question is, what is the approximate cost of the camera equipment required to take pictures of this quality? Well, in the youth competitions, which you saw some pretty good images, we actually had two kids that were photographing with point-and-shoot cameras that only shot JPEG images. So you can take a pretty darn good image with a point-and-shoot. The next level up is uh, I, I have a uh, Canon Rebel. Uh, my total cost of my 70 to 300 lens and my camera body was about $1,300. This is five years ago, so probably more like uh, $1,000. You can go from there. We have folks who will come to your ranch, and that's one of the things that make this so wonderful is, is security. People will come in your gate with $25,000 worth of camera equipment, and they will feel safe and secure that they can leave that equipment in their photo blind and go eat lunch and come back and it'll still be there. If they do that on private land, on public land, like a, a refuge, if they leave it there and come back, it's gone. And so they literally, what you're offering is safety of person and safety of equipment that they cannot get on public land. I hope that answers it. Great. Um, what is the average cost of blind setups? The, the entire setting, depending on how you want to do it, uh, is anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000, depending on how elaborate you want to be. But if you think about that, you already own the land and you already have the investment, and you and so here, let's use the top end. Let's say you create a setting for that's, that's literally uh, six feet wide, your blind six feet wide, 12 feet long, you've got your water, and you've got uh, you know the amenities that are almost free because you get them from around the ranch behind it, and, and you can set three photographers in there, uh, and let's say you use the same water hole for two blinds, and that's why it's $2,000. That, if, if you keep that setting full for 200 days of the year, not 365, just 200, that'll generate $60,000 a year income. Optimally, if once the branch is marketed and, and you really work at this, it's a job. It, this is creating like a restaurant or, or anything else. Uh, it's a job and it's a career and it's a, an industry 
and it's a business, and you need a good business plan. Uh, so there's nowhere and nothing that you can put on your ranch that will create $60,000 a year income from literally three photographers per day for 200 days of the year. Okay, and um, the costs of marketing for tournaments, is that, is that um, do the ranchers pay for those costs or is it paid for by ICF or from entry fees? How, how is that handled usually? Well, it, it really, like every other, uh, let's, let's take a McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's home office does nationwide advertising to try and drive people to your McDonald's restaurant. But if it's going to be successful, you have to be out there working and marketing also. Now, in, in McDonald's, you're only marketing locally. In this industry, uh, you're going to be marketing. If, if I use the, uh, the uh, uh, Santa Clara Ranch as an example, they have designated, and uh, Dr. Gatetis has designated a manager of the ranch. He photographs at that ranch from those photo bands three days or more a week and as often as he can. And he markets, he literally goes out and he, pays, he posts his images nationally on forums and he participates in everything that can possibly drive people to that ranch. And when he posts, he doesn't just put the, his name up. He puts that this image was taken at the Santa Clara Ranch, and they actively uh, work at this. When, when the North American Nature Photography Association came to McAllen, Beto had his own table, and, and when he, at the end of the four days, he came over to me and said, John, he said, I've just signed up $6,000 worth of, of people coming to my ranch. So he really works hard at this. The, it's, and that's why it's so important that the experience, getting people to come to your ranch the first time is, is a job in itself. It's like getting them to come into your restaurant for the first time. But getting them to come back is even more important. So if you're not feeding regularly, like having food at that photo setting two or three or four days a week, that's like having a restaurant saying, we're going to have tables and chairs, and we're going to have a, 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 a kitchen, but we're only going to serve food once a month. If you, you've got to buy the food, you've got to put it out there, and you've got to make sure things are coming there every single day, then you need somebody photographing from those blinds regularly every single week to show the world, hey, here's what we're photographing here. Here's what's actually coming to our settings. So that's the marketing that the ranch has to do. Images for Conservation Fund does the, we're, the purpose, one of the purposes of our pro-ams is to promote our ranches. So we have now had photographers come from all over the United States, and they have actually sat in the photo blinds, and they've paid for it, and we've written checks to uh, those Sonatas for $7,000 this year. But more importantly, we put people in their photo blinds that can then go out and talk to the rest. It's a, it's a very tight community, and a lot of this is word of mouth. So magazine advertising, you can spend a fortune on, on magazine advertising, you get nobody coming to your ranch. It's, it has to be very concise and it, good, it requires a good marketing plan on your part and then working with ICF. I hope that answered the question. Great. And John, um, can you tell us a little bit about how long it takes to plan one of these tournaments? Are we looking at 12 months, 24 months? How long would it take to get a tournament set up? Well, if, if you're brand new, if, for instance, in the Rio Grande Valley, we were able to get set up and, and get them filled this spring in about six months because all the ranches down here have a history of the public coming to the ranches. And the workshop leaders know that there's great photography here. And so they've been in articles and things. If you're brand new and never had a photographer on there, 
it's going to take, I would say I would want at least a year of great marketing with ICF to make one of these tournaments successful in your place. It is truly a long-term growing industry that you're not going to get instant, it's not like hitting an oil and gas well. Uh, it is, it requires planning, organization, and the emphasis is on working together to create a truly great experience on your ranch that will keep people coming year after year back to your place. Okay, we had a couple of people ask about um, if, the, if this uh, presentation will be available later. We have recorded it and um, this will be available on the TWA website. Um, I've gone ahead and posted a link there um, how to get to our, our webinars section on the TWA website. Um, also, John, you mentioned earlier that um, we are going to be having a uh, photography workshop in association with the uh, Texas Wildlife Association annual convention. Um, that's coming up. That photography workshop is next Thursday, June 28th from 2 to 4. And it's going to be um, hosted out at the JW Marriott where the TWA convention is being held this year. And um, it's, we're going to have a, the presenter is Sean Fitzgerald who, um, John, I believe you've worked with him before. He's participated in the contest, I believe. Sean, is that correct? Sean, yeah, Sean has been in the Valley Land Fund Wildlife Photo Contest. He's also been in the Pro Tour for Nature Photography. He also was just one of our, our coaches at the uh, May 17th uh, Pro uh, Am. And Sean is truly a great photographer and a good teacher. And I encourage everybody to sign up uh, because it, it, if you're interested in photography, Sean will do a good job teaching you. Excellent. And I know that we'll also have some photography uh, equipment and gear out there um, so that you can, you know, look at it hands-on and, and uh, pick it up and get a feel for it and um, see what, what's out there that you might want or need. Um, and of course, John Martin, our friend, will be out at the, um, at the TWA convention as well. Um, so he'll be there uh, probably all the whole time. John, are you going to be there uh, Friday and Saturday as well also? Uh, we're setting, we have a booth in the trade show. Uh, and we will be there from Thursday, we're going to set up Thursday afternoon, which is our time frame, and we're going to be Friday, Saturday, and we'll take down Sunday after when they tell us we can. Fabulous. Um, so, so here's the link to the Texas uh, Wildlife um, website, and if you want to sign up for that photography workshop, you can do it right there on the website. It's only $30. Um, and uh, we, John, of course, we uh, look forward to having you at the TWA convention as well. Uh, it looks like there aren't any other questions right at this time, um, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I apologize for the technical difficulties, especially John and David. Thank you all for trying to work through them and I think as the SEALs say, uh, adapt and overcome. Um, and folks, we appreciate you uh, bearing through it with us as well and um, hopefully we won't run into these issues again. We're going to be having our next Wildlife for Lunch webinar on July 19th and Lewis Harvison will be our guest presenter there talking about uh, the uh, Pegasus Wildlife Management and um, particularly pronghorns. Um, so hopefully folks will join us then. Um, thank you all so much on behalf of TWA and AgriLife Extension. John, thank you so much for your presentation. It is absolutely wonderful. Um, and we just appreciate everyone for being here. Well, thank you and thank you for the opportunity to uh, get our message out because if we've got to have conservation, but we've got to do it to the private landowner. Absolutely. And um, uh, John's, <coughs> excuse me, John's contact information is there on the screen, so if anybody uh, needs some more information, feel free to contact him, or you can also uh, email me, Courtney Britton, at the Texas Wildlife Association. Thank you all. Courtney, thank you. Thank you, Bye. John.